Hi everyone, this is Lori Ward, Washington's National Park Fund CEO. We'll be starting here in just another minute. We had uh, over 100 people sign up for this webinar today. Very interesting topic for all of us. It is for me personally. Uh, I know we'll be enlightened greatly today by Patty Happy, Wildlife Chief uh, at Olympic National Park. I've worked with Patty for many years. I've had the privilege of um, working with her through the Marmot Program, the elk monitoring, the fishers, uh, the goat transports, and she's just a privilege to, just a treat to work with. Smart, articulate, funny, um, a real, <laughs> uh, just a real joy. So as we get started here, I just want to share, I'm CEO, like I said, of Washington's National Park Fund. We started these uh, virtual field trips. I hope you have your boots ready to go and your lunch packed. We started these probably six weeks ago, and the response has been like really overwhelming. And um, obviously we're hitting a chord with everyone. You enjoy learning about the things that we're highlighting. We had over a thousand young people sign up for a junior ranger program. So we're happy that we were able to jump on this. I just wanna go hats off to my wonderful colleagues at Washington's National Park Fund who are making it happen behind the scenes, especially Sharon London. Uh, so uh, we'll get started here right now and Patty, welcome. Thank you for Thank being you. here today. Thank you for your time, your dedication to the work that you do. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, welcome. I don't, I can't see. Did you start the poll already? Or no. Okay. Yet. Okay. So I'm going to. What? Go ahead. You're good. Go ahead. Go ahead. I guess we should start the poll. We have one poll. I'm going to be talking about um, mountain goat management on the Olympic Peninsula, in particular Olympic National Park. We have just a quick question for you to get us started. And the, the answer to this poll will, be, will come out like in like slide four, so you don't have to wait very long. And I can't see over here so you guys tell me when we should stop Lori do we have do we have enough people on the poll or we're all set looking good go ahead and continue on okay well that's really interesting let's get going I, I'm impressed with these answers so I don't know, could you guys see me? Yep. Okay, let's start with the PowerPoint then. And I can't see it. Can you guys see the PowerPoint presentation? Oh, she's starting. Okay, jumping ahead. Great, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'm just gonna, in a half an hour, try to go quickly through what's been a 20 year journey here at Olympic, Na well, more than that, but for me, it's been a 20 year journey at Olympic National Park. Um, talking about our mountain goat management plan, a little bit of the history and mainly focusing on an update on where we are today with the program and our plans for next year and the next um, next couple of years. Next slide, please. So I think as most of you know who have been following this in the news, mountain goats are not native to Olympic National Park. They are native to um, uh, the Northwest up uh, from in United States and up into Canada and Alaska, but not to Olympic National Park. The population was introduced here. Next slide, please. And you can see why, um, you know, that they are not native. If you look at Olympic National Park, which is outlined in red, we really are a mountain island um, that is separated from the remaining um, uh, mountains in the Pacific Northwest by uh, the Puget Trough, and we're surrounded on three sides by salt water. Next slide, please. So mountain goats were introduced into the Olympic Peninsula, and those of you who guessed 11 to 12 were right on. They were introduced to the Olympic Peninsula by a sportsman's club prior to the formation of the park, and the release sites were kind of in the northern end of the peninsula near Lake Crescent. 
There were actually um, three different releases of three to four goats each, um, and they came from three different places, uh, the Chugach Range in Alaska, and then two other sites in British Columbia. The population, oh, next slide, please. Oh, she, she jumped ahead. Yeah, the population, uh, great. No, you're good, <laughs> you're good. The population gradually grew and colonized the peninsula and there was not a lot of data recorded um, at that time. Um, but so what you're seeing now is kind of anecdotal uh, reports of when goats were seen. And then parentheses is when kids at heel were reported. But it appears from the um, observations that the uh, mountain goat population gradually recolonized colonized the Olympics, kind of working around um, the east side of the peninsula and ending up kind of the, at last, at the last place where they were really spotted to have any stronghold was on Mount Olympus itself in the Western Olympics. Next slide, please. So by the 1970s, the population was growing and had grown uh, pretty precipitously and the Park Service was getting concerns about what they were seeing about the effects of this non-native species on the alpine ecosystems and research started um, around that time. And by the 1980s, uh, when research was kind of in full flung, the estimate of Kalahani Ridge itself was over 220 goats just in that small area. Um, we're also seeing um, you know, impacts on the native vegetation and the goats themselves like to wallow and so great patches of areas were denuded by their uh, wallowing. So there was a lot of research that was focused in the park, but I'll, most of it was in the Kalahani Ridge, mainly because uh, it was the most accessible piece that we could get to. Next slide, please. So in 1983, the park uh, was able to do the first range-wide population estimate using helicopters, and it was pretty innovative at that time. So uh, what um, my predecessors developed was a stratified random sampling regime where they classified the park in areas of what they thought was high, medium, and low density goat habitat. The high density patches are outlined in red. What they thought was medium density goats where there was maybe one to 10 were in orange. And then the green were where they thought was low density goat habitat where they thought there really weren't any goats. And then they did the helicopter survey and that estimate came back at over a thousand goats in the park with a pretty like wide confidence interval. And that was because there was quite a few surprises. There were areas where they thought they had low density goat populations where there actually was quite a bit. And I wanna point you to that area down at Chimney Peak in the um, Quinault Valley where they thought there was one to 10 goats in that unit and there ended up being 52. Wow. Um, the other um, thing I want to point you to is the Olympic range at that time was classified as a low density goat habitat and there really weren't any surveys there. So this um, population estimate was, was really informative and so the Park Service went into a management phase. Next slide please. Um, where we captured and translocated um, as many goats as they could um, and this graphics kind of shows um, how many goats were removed from uh, different regions of the park. Some goats were removed prior to the surveys. Um, so Klahani Ridge, they had already started removing goats, but you can see that most of the goats that were removed from the park were taken from um, the area on the east side of the park, um, but they were able also to pull some off of uh, Mount Olympus. Next slide, please. So the capture and translocation operation stopped in, in 1989 when it was getting increasingly hard to catch goats and there was a concern that we're putting human life at risk and, um, and also the capture mortalities were getting un, you know, un alarmingly high. So the Park Service had reached the, the uh, conclusion that they had caught all the goats that were catchable and in order to remove the remaining goats, we had to switch to lethal removal. There was an, a draft EIS that was prepared and was released to the public in um, 95 that was very contentious at the time and it actually did not move forward. So we did not implement that plan. Next slide, please. And so no management actions happened on mountain goats after 1989 and the population stayed actually 
at low levels following those removals um, in the 80s and stayed at low levels um, at around 300 goats. Um, and this slide here shows you the survey from 94, where you can see that almost all the goats were removed from Klahani Ridge in the east side of the park, but there was a remaining nucleus of goats on that chimney uh, crystal peak area in the Quinault, where you can see there was 39 goats and six goats in the unit north of that, and also still quite a few goats left on Mount Olympus. Next slide, please. So this graphic shows the population uh, surveys and estimates that we've been able to do over the years. So the population was pretty stable at low levels um, from like 1990 on to 2004. And I arrived here on the scene in the park in 96. Um, but after the 2004 survey, we started noticing that goats were showing up in areas where we hadn't seen them for a while, like on Klahani Ridge. And so we ratcheted up our research on trying to both um, devise a better way of um, counting goats and uh, paying better attention, well, starting to pay more attention to what was going on with the population. Next slide, please. So also interestingly, as the population started increasing in 2004, we started seeing goats showing up in really unusual areas. And when they showed up back on Klahani Ridge, they were already habituated and used to people. Um, and it's that salt seeking behavior where there is no really natural salt licks in the Olympic range. And goats have a high affinity for salts in areas where they are native, there's natural salt licks. Um, we also started seeing a return to those impacts on vegetation and soils that we'd seen before. Next slide, please. And this graphic kind of shows you um, the level and distribution of interactions of, uh, we had between goats and humans uh, throughout the park. So on the upper left-hand side, this is a recording of goat observations that we got from visitors and from the park staff. We have asked people to record what type of interaction you had. Did you just see a goat or did it follow you or was it aggressive? And over half the interactions that we were having recorded between goats and people were had some level of habituation. That is that goats were comfortable being around people and then it moves along the continuum to they were actually aggressively following them seeking salts. And then the slide in the upper right um, shows that these interactions were actually occurring throughout the park with most of the occurrences either on Hurricane Ridge or in Seven Lakes Basin. So basically anywhere where we had uh, high visitor use and high numbers of goats, we were getting this returning to these high levels of interaction between goats and people and goats actively seeking out salts from people. Uh, next slide, please. So we were concerned about the growth in the, the growth population and the return to these behaviors that were problematic and the return to the interactions. And so a couple things were happening simultaneously from around 2009 on. And the one thing was that in, in around 2013 or so, I was looking for money to do a repeat of our goat surveys. And I finally was able to get that funded and we did actually a survey in 2011 and then 2016. And we were able to document that the population was indeed significantly increasing and that the distribution of goats on the Olympic Peninsula had shifted. This graphic actually shows just the 2016 survey. And that um, at that time, we had estimated there was over 600 goats on the Olympic Peninsula. So up from that 300 that we had in 2004, and that it, the population was growing at a rate of around 8% 8 a year. Um, the other, um, well, I'll just kind of stop there. Well, I guess the other th thing is to note that the majority of the population is now distributed around Mount Olympus, continues to be around that Chimney Peak Crystal, but there's also recolonization of both Klahani Ridge and then working over to the east side. Next slide, please. So um, simultaneously in 2013, I looked for funding to start doing a, a revamp our mountain goat management plan and try for a second round. And we were able to get funding for that. We started the EIS or the NEPA process in 2014. 
This time, uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Forest Service signed on as cooperators in this process from the get-go. So when we started working on this NEPA document, it was not just a Park Service document, it's a document that also involves Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and three of the national forests. We went out to public scoping saying that we're going to do a mountain goat management plan um, in September. We had a draft EIS uh, that was prepared and released in 2017. We took extensive comments from the public, integrated those comments, and came out with a final plan in May of 2018 and got approval to move ahead in June of 2018. Now, the, park the Forest Service's decision process is a little different from the Park Service's. So we had approval to move ahead on the Park Service in June 2018, but the full Forest Service approval didn't happen until December of 2018. Next slide, please. So the, in this document and what we're subsequently doing, you know, everything is kind of driven by what the purpose and need is behind the action. And so, um, you know, it sounds like legalese, but it really does guide this and help shape where we're going. And so our number one purpose and need is to reduce the interference with the natural processes from, this, from these exotic mountain goats. And then also to reduce the hazards that, that mountain goats pose to human safety in Olympic National Park and on the Olympic Peninsula on adjoining national forest lands. Next slide, please. We have additional objectives in this plan to work cooperatively with our co-managers of mountain goats in the state. That's Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Forest Service and, and regional tribes in supporting their wildlife management objectives. And one of our objectives in this plan that we didn't have in our prior plan in the 90s is that we want to reestablish mountain goats in portions of their range in the state where they are native. Next slide, please. And the, the reason for this is that, um, well, although the mountain goat population was increasing uh, in the Olympics, in the Cascades where they're native, the population had gone through a precipitous decline and it was not recovering even after they had years where um, there was no hunting in the area. And the research that the state and, and other partners conducted, they determined that the reason these numbers were so low in these areas was that they were essentially over harvested, which happened in a lot of areas in the West. Um, I think folks just didn't understand that you cannot manage mountain goats like you manage deer or elk. They have a lower reproductive rate. So the state was wanting goats to recover their populations. Um, and in fact, I had been in conversations with the state since 2009, where they were looking for um, a way to start translocating goats to uh, recover their populations. Next slide, please. So after public review, um, and we integrated several public comments into our alternatives, our preferred alternative was D, which is a combination of capture and translocation, um, and then following that with uh, lethal removal. Uh, we understand from past experience here working in the 80s that there is some fraction of the population that we can safely capture and translocate, but then there's become a point where we're not going to be able to get them all. And so we, we need to switch at some point to a lethal removal. Next slide, please. So in the selective alternative, um, this is a, actually a 20-year plan. We have five years of active management where we're going to be uh, have the um, helicopter operations twice a year uh, to both capture and translocate or followed by lethal removal, and then 15 years of maintenance. So that means that after the capture, the five years of active management is done, we can still continue to manage whatever mountain goats show up again without having to go um, and do another plan. So this plan right now, um, we are catching as many goats as we safely and efficiently can. Um, I'm trying to catch as many as I can get. We're gonna stop though when the capture crew determines that it is not safe to do it anymore. Either the, the terrain where the remaining goats are, you cannot safely land a helicopter or put a crew out, or when you try to catch a goat, it has nothing to do but fall. We're just not gonna you know, operate when it's not safe. Also, when it's no longer efficient, um, you know, if it takes about three times as much to catch a goat near the end of the operation than it was in the beginning, we know that it's just not an efficient use of the public resources. We also have the provision to, to stop the operation when there's no more places to put them or no more resources for translocation. 
So in our active management phase, we have two 12-day periods of helicopter operations each year. One is going to be in midsummer, in mid to late July, and then the other is going to be late summer. And we're only operating over one weekend and not on any holidays to, to try to minimize as much as possible the impacts on the visitors to the park. Um, we've already determined that the only way we can catch them is the use of helicopters, but we acknowledge that this is an intrusion in the wilderness. So we're doing the best we can to um, accommodate all users, I guess. Next slide, please. So in the EIS, um, and after talking with the capture crew, we estimate that we could catch about half of the population. So projecting the 8% growth rate uh, of the 625 goats that we thought we had in 2016, we estimate that we would have around 725 goats when we started operating in 2018. So giving us a kind of a wide margin for error, I estimated that with two years and four capture bouts, we could catch around 250 to 350 goats and that they would be translocated. And this table shows the estimated amount of helicopter use that we thought we would also need to do in order to reach those objectives. Next slide, please. So in our plan, the Park Service is responsible solely for the capture of the goats throughout the park and also on adjoining, na adjoining national forest lands. Um, we're hiring a highly skilled contract crew. They are, these are wildlife capture specialists that operate throughout the West. Um, they catch these goats either by using uh, uh, immobilizing darts or a net gun and they, they get on the goats as quickly as possible, and then they stabilize them, secure them, and then bring them to a staging area. Next slide, please. Because the Olympics are so large, we have two staging areas in operation, one in the north on Park Service lands at Hurricane Hill, and the other on the southeast on Forest Service land, and we ended up only using the one at the Hamahama site. And the reason for these two staging areas, even though it makes the operation a little more complex, it minimizes the ferry time that these goats have where they have to be transported in the air. We're really concerned about um, animal welfare in this operation. Um, and it also is more efficient use of helicopter, uh, helicopter time. So this graphic actually shows uh, goats that have been captured down near uh, Chimney Peak and they're being staged for transport to one of the staging areas. Next slide, please. So the crew, um, they had when they as soon as they get on the goats, um, they secure them um, by hobbling them, blindfolding them, putting on horn guards, just kind of, and that calms them down quite a bit. And then they have these specially made sling bags where they load them all up individually and then bring them to the staging area. The capture drug we're using is really efficient. They actually go down within one minute. Um, and on average, and the actual ferry time between when an animal is darted and it gets back to the staging area, it averages around a half an hour. And the crew is so skilled, the pilot will actually drop the goats in the back of the, the truck that we're using to ferry them down to the staging area. Next slide, please. And for animal welfare, while they're flying in the air, we want them to be able to hold their head up and breathe. So. If the drug is used, the capture drug, they are actually reversed on site. So they are fully awake uh, when they come into us at the staging area. Next slide, please. And at the, at the, the um, hella base where the goats are dropped off, we do a, a check um, on their welfare uh, right when they come in. And if there's any problems, we take care of them right away, do some emergency stuff that rarely happens, and then prepare them for transport down to where the veterinarians are. I think the next slide is going to be a, a quick video of how the operation went last year.
Next slide, please. So as you can see, the, the goats, once they're dropped up the helibase, we take them down to a processing area where we have a crew of veterinarians and skilled um, and biologists that process each animal. Um, this slide shows the results of the capture operation in September 2018. We did not have permission to work on Forest Service. So we just caught within the park, mainly focusing on um, the areas around Hurricane Ridge and then also around Mount Olympus. And, and, and that capture bout, we removed a total of 115 goats from the park. Next slide, please. And in 2019, we were able to fully implement the plan um, operating on both Forest Service and Park Service lands. And we are able to remove a total of two, 211 goats from the, from the peninsula. So we see here the green dots uh, represent every place where a goat was caught, and then the lines are just the helicopter flight path. So it gives you an idea of uh, how big the operation was last year. We actually were able to remove 31 goats from the Forest Service land. About half of those came from the Eleanor area. And this was the first time we were able to work outside the park. We weren't able to do that in the 80s. Next slide, please. And again, I just cannot um, thank enough the veterinarian staff that was here on site. The um, Hurricane Hill operation was led by Dr. Jenny Powers, a Park Service vet. She's shown here near the tail end of the goat on top. And then also on the bottom, the Forest Service site was managed by Washington Park Fish and Wildlife. And there's Kristen Mansfield, the lead vet for Washington Park Fish and Wildlife down there on the bottom. Next slide, please. And the operation at, at Hamahama was very similar to what we had at Hurricane Hill, except we're operating over a large gravel pit there where the helicopter can just drop the goats right in the pit and then they take them quickly over to the processing areas. Next slide, please. So this is what we've caught so far. Um, we've removed a total of 326 goats from the park. Um, we were able to do some limited lethal removal uh, last year um, as per the plan when the helicopter team felt that they've tried to catch this goat um, or goats in this area many times and they could, could, knew they couldn't be successful. Um, the pilot actually had the operation to go up to 20% lethal removal last year and he went far underneath that. They were mainly focusing on capture. Now there is some level of capture mortality in this operation. So some animals did die in the field or we had to euthanize them when they came back to the staging area, but our capture mortality rate is under 6% overall. Um, 16 kids were transported to zoos and we had a, hold, a total of 275 goats that were actually released into the Cascades. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, that we did send 16 kids to uh, Northwest Trek, but then brokered them to other zoos throughout the, the country, mainly in the Pacific Northwest. There's five of the kids at Northwest Trek, and there's a couple in Woodland Park Zoo, and then also down in Oregon Zoo. Next slide, please. So going back to what I estimated that we would do in the EAS, I thought that, you know, in three capture bouts, we would catch around 257 goats. We've actually are way above that. Um, we're being more efficient than I thought we could be, and we actually have removed about as many goats as I thought we could remove in three cap in four capture bouts. So we're we're doing well as far as catching goats efficiently. However, we have only released 275 in the Cascades, so we're gonna try to get them more goats and do one more capture bout this year. Next slide, please. So you can kind of click it and. Um, so after we're done catching them, we hand the goats over to Washington Park Fish and Wildlife, and they have an army of about 100 volunteers who show up every day and, and put the goats in refrigerator trucks and move them over to the Cascades for release in selected sites in, um, in well, throughout the Cascades, but mainly in Northern Cascades where the population is native and, and depleted. Next slide, please. So one of the interesting, well, one of the great things about this project is almost all the adult goats that we're releasing have GPS radio collars, so we can follow where, both where they move and what their fate is. Um, the state had plans to fly goats into the best habitat possible so that we could give them the best start, however, the weather has not cooperated with them. And about half the time, they've been able to fly them into good goat habitat. And the other half the time, they've had to release them from the back of the truck. Next slide, please. 
I think this one you need to click. Next slide, please. So about half the time, I think you need to click on this one. They do get to release them in the cascades and get them into the, you know, the fly them into the better goat habitat. And this is the release for those. You can see a kid following its mom. They put these fences up to direct them kind of where to go to shoot them to the best habitat, but they don't always listen to that. And uh, sometimes they're a little stiff coming out of the crate, but all in all, they're doing pretty well. Next slide, please. So this gives you a breakdown on where the goats have been released so far, for those of you who are familiar with the Cascades, um, kind of broken down by release area. Um, if you're really paying attention, I said we released 275. They've re they're counting 276 because they actually had a goat that was native to the Cascades that was hanging around people's houses. So they moved him as part of this operation. Next slide, please. So this is a distribution of where the goats have kind of hung out so far following the releases. So they're in clusters of habitat in the Cascades. Over 90% survived during the first 50 days. So that's about what we expect for translocation. It is, it is tough on them. So, but about 95% 90 90 of them have survived that post-release uh, phase. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, all the adults have radio calls on them so we can track their fate and survival. My state partners have been doing an analysis of you know, what factors are influencing goat survival in the Cascades. And the really good news is there's nothing that we are doing that, can, that we can directly control that is influences the survival rate. There's no influence of how long they were held, what capture method we used, um, how long it took from when the capture crew had them down on the ground to when they brought them back to us. None of those factors are significant. Not surprisingly, the most significant factors in survival is those goats that we capture that are in good shape survive better than those who were uh, thin when we caught them. So translating that, females that we caught that didn't have kids, they do better than the females that did have kids that heal because they're stressed from the, you know, they're in less, they're in poorer condition because of the strains from pregnancy and lactation. The other interesting thing is that the goats that we were able to fly into wilderness areas are actually doing better than the ones that we flew into, that we weren't able to fly into wilderness, but released in the back of a, from a car. They got into the better habitat. And there's some indication that the goats that came from areas where they were habituated are doing a little bit better than the goats that were in, you know, really didn't encounter people. And don't have any explanation for that one. Next slide, please. Now we are, the kids that didn't go to zoos uh, that we caught, we released them with their mothers. We wanted to give them a chance. Um, and we really tried very hard to hold the kids back and hold the nannies back and release them together. Their survival rate is not great. It's probably around 50 to 30%. However, kids survival rate in the wild is only around 50%. Um, the interesting thing to us though, is none of the kids are with their mothers, even though they were released together. They sup, the nannies leave the kids behind at some point during the release, uh, soon after the translocation. None of the kids are traveling with their moms. However, most of them have found other goats to follow. And this is one of our kids that was released that's hooked up with a, a Billy um, that uh, was native to the Northern Cascades. The other thing that is of interest to us is that seven of the 15 nannies that we could find that um, from the air and see them uh, last summer that were released in, in the fall of 2018, actually were able to hook up with other goats and, and breed uh, this spring. 
or have kids that heal this spring. So that's encouraging that these goats that are surviving are gonna be able to um, help rebuild the populations in the Cascades. Next slide, please. The other thing that we've looked at is the genetics of the population in the Olympics and compared to the Cascades and, and we're working with a, the, the best geneticists for goats in North America. And we pretty much determined definitively that these goats are not related to any other goats in the, in the Northwest. Um, but the other thing is, is that with the depleted population of the Cascades, they've lost a lot of genetic diversity. So bringing these genes in will also um, help the population of the Cascades by increasing their genetic diversity. Next slide, please. So we have one more, as I said, capture operation plan for this summer. We're going to go the last week of July and the first week of August and doing exactly what we did last year. The only closure that's going to be in the park is just that area around Hurricane Hill where the helicopter is coming in and out of. And we think that will be it as far as the capture operations. Next slide, please. And then we're going to switch to lethal removal and at based or in response to comments that we received in the EIS about um, letting people come in and help out and minimizing the amount of carcasses left in the landscape and trying to minimize the amount of helicopter use, we're going to start off with the ground removal by using volunteers. Um, that we, I opened the window for the recruiting volunteers last week and it closed down last Friday. So we had a lot of interest in this. Um, the vetting process is happening right now. <laughs> um, groups had to apply, people had to apply in groups of three to six, and then the selected groups will have to go through uh, a day of training um, and be official Park Service volunteers. Next slide, please. And we'll direct them, you know, where to go, how to interact with the public. And I'm really stressing this is not a hunt. This is a, we're using volunteers to help with the culling process. Um, next slide, please. And this kind of gives you a distribution of, it, this map shows the areas where folks are going to be um, sent to. We've already removed a lot of goats from a lot of these areas. The remaining goats are gonna be in really difficult spots like Chimney, Crystal, Moncaster, and Olympus. So we're gonna do the, the best we can to remove as many goats as we can from the ground. However, my main concern is that people are gonna be, be able to operate safely in the park. Um, next slide, please. And I just want to thank everybody who helped um, on this operation. You know, every day we start off working um, at the processing sites with um, regrouping and, and circle time and getting everybody um, squared away and what their role is going to be. And there's no way we could do this without a bunch of volunteers from other agencies and tribes coming in and helping us. And this is this circle shows all the people that help out in the staging area each day. Um, but we would have been nowhere without the skilled capture crew and then my partner from Washington Park Fish and Wildlife, Rich Harris, who's shown on the bottom, and Brian Murphy from Washington Park Fish and Wildlife and our veterinarians. And then I want to give a shout out to the gentleman on the far lower right. That's Doug Houston, who was the park's uh, research wildlife biologist who started all the research or did a lot of it um, here in the 80s and 90s. And it's upon the foundation of science that he laid down that we're able to move forward. And that's all I have. I think I might've gone a little over. Sorry about that. Well, I personally just find this so fascinating. The part that moves me most, Patty, and I'm sure I imagine it's consistent, is when, when I'm happy to hear that their heads are not covered so that they can breathe naturally in transport I just love that yeah. yeah oh yeah they're they're breathing and they're wide awake and then they each go into an individual crate uh, for the translocation over to the cascades that keeps them safe calm and cool and collected there's a lot that we do for animal care that I just didn't have time to go over oh, I know that about you that you um, this matters a lot to you the proper care I also appreciate when you see them coming out of the crates um, and it's cute when the one jump the yellow fence, you know, it's like they don't always do what you want them to do. But Well, there's a lot more material in our annual reports that are on the park's website if anybody is interested. I have some great comments and questions. Um, one comes from Nancy Hawks. Nancy is the director of animal care at Woodland Park Zoo. Oh. And she, said, 
She says the, um, the goats at Northwest Trek and Woodland Park Zoo are doing great. So passing on that message from Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Good. And Rob Smith, a good friend of Washington's National Park Fund, wants to know, can the park realistically get to 100% goat removal? Will some be left without capture or kill? Well, we estimate that we're probably going to get about 90% of them. And then I'm thinking that, you know, based on the experience that the state had in the Cascades, where this, they're so easily over harvested, if we can get the population down that much that they will be, if not removed, we'll be able to control them and they'll be gone. And then finally, Patty, someone asked midway through, it was when you were in a series of slides, so I'm not sure you'll be able to connect the dots here, but this person's asking, what is the management section on the population map? Does that make sense to uh, you? Yes, so in the, in the aerial survey, um, there was areas that were stratified uh, based on projected goat density, high, medium, and low. And then there were other areas where we just, we had specific management concerns. We were gonna fly them no matter what. Klahani Ridge was one of them. Um, and also kind of it, for a while, they're the east side of the Olympics. We want to see what's happening there. And for a while they were flying Mount Dana because there were some vegetation plots there too. Mm -hmm. So areas of special management concern we forced into the survey. I know I speak for everyone who's still on the line. Um, just thank you for the good work that you do and the care that you put into all of the, the work that you do with wildlife in, in Olympic National Park. Folks, we have some great programs coming up over the next couple of weeks. We'll be up in the North Cascades next Wednesday and the following Wednesday we'll be down at Mount Rainier. We're rotating around the three parks that we work with. Continue to sign up. There's obviously a great deal of interest. We know that you love your parks as much as we do and you care about them. So we hope you're getting a great deal out of these webinars, uh, these virtual field trips. They are all recorded and then loaded up to our, our website and our web address is wnpf.org, wnpf.org. Go there, sign up, look back at past webinars. Patty did one probably six weeks ago. You were first with, on the, um, the Fishers, the Fisher release. So we appreciate that. Uh, thanks everyone. Keep supporting your parks. And by the way, two things, uh, happy Earth Day and oh. yeah. Word on the street today, yeah. Yes. I was actually at the first Earth Day rally in Philadelphia, so this is full circle. It was a school that trip. That takes you right back, doesn't it? Well, around we, there, yeah. yeah. That's great. We are um, hearing rumblings today that the President of the United States may be announcing that uh, they are making efforts to open the national parks. We'll see where that goes, yes. So everyone stay tuned. Um, Again, thanks for your support. We appreciate you. Take good care. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone.